Hi guys. I quite legitimately don't think that I've ever had a video take this long to shoot. I've tried four times to shoot this video. Every time something has gone wrong. Uh, I'm hoping this time with the new setup that uh, we should have a little bit more luck. Um, my biggest problem here is going to be can I actually stop the video. So um, we've made some changes to the camera setup. I can now actually see what I'm shooting. Um, the broken phone... Um, Having mashed my P30 Pro, which I use for filming, um, I've gone and ordered a new one, but kept the mashed one, which I'm now using with a monitor to uh, keep an eye on things. So, I touched on the fact that I'd be doing this video. This is about ambulance control systems, in particular the Genesis system. Um, why we use them, how the system works. We've got a couple of modules here. We've got one module here, we should have two. There's the other one. So we've got a couple of modules here that are open so that we can have a bit of a poke around. Um, hopefully the video presentation will be a bit better now because I can see what's actually going on. So the first question is uh, why go to all this length? I mean this is a lot of work for you know a couple of switches, a couple of bits of kit that need to be turned on and off. Um, unfortunately that's not the case. Modern Ambulance now is an incredibly complicated beast. Um, each one of these modules controls, I believe it's 16 channels, yep. So um, you've got at least 32 channels of switching going on here. In fact, I think you've actually got more than that on this one. Uh, one no, there's 32 here. Um, and not all of these switches are straight on and off. Some need to be synchronised with some, some things. For example, um, you want to know that the vehicle's gone into reverse. Um, to turn on the, re the reversing camera um, you don't want to be able to turn the air conditioning on without the engine running and there's stuff in here to control the batteries as well um, for example tr um, battery transfer um, your average ambulance has uh, between two and three batteries um, quite often you have a chassis battery which is the battery that the vehicle came with you then have an auxiliary battery which runs everything else and or a comms battery and sometimes you'll have a third battery which either doubles of the comms battery if the other one's an auxiliary or it runs things like your tail lift and things like that i have seen one or two mercedes vehicles with four batteries on where there is a fourth battery solely to run the tail lift um, an auxiliary battery a main battery and um, a comms battery as well there's a third, another variation on that where there's actually even a smaller battery, about a 50 ampere hour battery, underneath the driver's seat just to run this lot. Um, so yeah, we're all getting very complicated. We're just looking at power management at that point. Um, and then as I say, you start looking at things whereby if one battery, if one battery is becoming low, then we'll switch off some of this stuff. Um, and we can start prioritizing loads so um, for example if I look here we've got the incubator and we have a defib power they're probably the last things that you want to fail so we prioritize the battery access to them we are monitoring the battery voltage as well most of the systems work on a very similar sort of layout um, Genesis is fairly unique in this layout our own system is quite similar we have sub modules um, then there is a earlier version it's called Phoenix where this is all in one massive control box normally just behind the driver's seat um, there is the Woodway and Wheeland systems which are much much simpler and only really intended to work the emergency lighting systems and there's other variations on these as well uh, this system is still in use um, Ring Automotive now support it Carnation Designs I believe were purchased by Ring um, they've made some changes. You have a lovely touchscreen unit now rather than that. Again, our own system uses touchscreens. Um, but they're all the same. Uh, bare minimum on a Genesis system, you're going to have an ECU, which is this box here. This does all the inputs on the system. So, for example, we've got, you won't be able to read them here, but I can point them out. Side lights, reverse gear, brake lights, ignition, engine running, dip beam, CCTV fault. Um, speed trigger, rear suspension, handbrake, cab doors, side load doors, rear doors, panic strip, battery charger and ramp deployment. So that's all your inputs. Um, have I got the case for the other one? No, it's on my desk. Um, this one here that we have that's in bits is quite 
similar. Let me just pull this out. Um, but it has different programming. Um, with this system, all your programming is actually stored in the ECU. Um, so these are dumb boxes and it's what's in the ECU that actually matches. Um, the display is also a dumb unit as is the keypad. Um, so everything is held in here. Uh, let's get a quick close up look at that if I can get that without the light swamping it out. You've not got much on here. I assume this is going to focus for me. Yes? No? Oh god it's picking up some horrible flickering. So. I've got the Allen key. Um, they're fairly simple. You have a PIC 18 series device, a ROM, which I believe carries all the sound and voice this system talks, and I'll make this one talk in a minute. And that's all there really is to it. There's a bit of glue logic, a bit of power supply logic, but that's the ECU. That's all the work where all the work's done. Um, can I make this talk? I don't think it wants to talk at the moment. Uh, let me try. Attendant required assistance. Warning. CCTV in operation. You are being recorded. And there's your control panel. That is roughly an ISO DIN sized unit. Um, they will fit into the normal nooks, nooks and crannies in vehicles. And they're quite renowned for the keypad self destructing. Um, We've done service and repair on quite a few of these. Um, for whatever reason, Warning. it's not particularly durable. And operation. I think we will shut you that up. Recorded. So you've got everything going on in the ECU. Now the system is designed um, to be modular. So I'm going to pull that out of the middle. And this is where with a modular type wiring, as you've just seen, I've just pulled this control unit out of the middle. All oh, that flickering only comes back when I get close. Um, I've pulled this unit out in the middle and as you can see half the system has gone dead. In fact everything other than the ECU has gone dead. Um, and that's one of the ways that these systems can fall down. Can I move you over without causing complete disaster? Sort of. So, just move this around. What we have here, you can't see it too clearly. Sorry, laminate floor. So. Uh, this chair tends to work, wander around. So every th these modules bolt onto a bus bar. This bus bar is provided with um, the power to run everything output wise here. Um, these two are split. This was set up originally as two modules side by side. So there would have been another set of units there back to back. They've got good cooling. Um, they sort of most things on them. Um, I believe the ECU provides the power for the bus, so these don't necessarily have to be screwed down to this to be powered up. Um, therefore, the ECU is also going to power your displays and everything else. Um, I was going to plug that back in, but I won't. So, in mean, demonstration here, we have an ECU, uh, not an ECU, we have an IO, port, IO unit or output unit. That's not screwed down to the bus, and you'll see we're woken up and we're happy. Now, a lot of the vehicles you see these in, these are going to be all bolted to the back of the, bul of the bulkhead, normally behind the passenger or driver's seat. Um, there's no reason to do that, other than the fact that with most of these vehicles now, that's where the wiring harnesses are. Generally, under the driver's seat or under the passenger seat, you'll have all the heavy-duty battery switching, um, your split charging and things like that. Um, I suppose from that point of view, it makes sense for it all to be there. There is no reason why you can't have, say, one of these programmed to do, say, all the blue lights or all the equipment at the very back of the unit and actually have this module back there. Sorry, you're bouncing a bit. Um... It just doesn't seem to be the way they do it and indeed we have our own system and that is designed specifically to be used as a modular type assembly um, and we have boards designed to fit into light bars and things like that. We'll have a look inside these um, modules in a second um, but as you can imagine this wall goes together as quite a rat's nest. Uh, those of you that know these systems or know of these systems or drive vehicles fitted to them you'll know that there are some foibles with these um, those of you 
who have sat there for most of your shift being told that your side door's open, for example, or the battery's low. They do appear to be quite sensitive to vehicle um, electrical system problems. And if you do own a vehicle that has Genesis on, for God's sake, do not ever jumpstart it. Um, there appears to be an issue with the programming of the ECU, uh, the micro in the ECU and in the um, IO, I keep calling them IO units, their output units, um, whereby they have not enabled brownout detection on these. So you connect your jump start up, this starts to boot, you then turn the key which causes a brownout and wipes the flash. It's a known problem with PIC chips. Um, we've seen it on some of our um, embedded stuff. It's part of the reason that we've moved away to STM32s. Um, that and a bit more processing power. Um, but obviously, if you wipe one of these, yeah, okay, it needs firmware back. That's not a problem. You know, it is pretty much that's the same firmware as that, as that, as that. However, if you want the firmware on the ECU, the only people that can actually reprogram that are Ring themselves. Um, that means that you're sending that unit off for reprogramming. Um, they're a good bunch. They'll do it normally free of charge. Um, they'll get it turned around fairly quickly. But if you've got a vehicle that urgently needs to go out, that's really not going to help you. Um, so, yeah. Um, there are other things, excuse me, reaching in front of you that you'll find attached to these. So we have here, if I can get it so we get less flicker and uh, a good look at the front. We have an audio switch module. So this was used in conjunction with this ECU and a wiring harness. And this allowed the audio to be switched around the vehicle, depending on where, the, where people were working and what the message was. Um, I believe this also works as an intercom. Then we've also got, because we're taking in, where is the ECU again? We're taking the speed, um, door switches, um, speed, tri excuse me, speed triggers and things like that, ignition engine running. These are all available in the wiring harness or they're available over CAN. So, ah, oh, hiccups now. This um, little device plugs into the vehicle CAN bus, takes power and provides these signals out. For that we do something similar but we do it in the ecu itself our ecus do speak can so on the network cables between these um they are just straight cat5 um for the longest time there did appear to be some very very strange things going on with these cables having now spoken to ring and actually done some work with this test rig on our bench these are just straight cat5 cables so there's nothing mysterious about these we believe they did have swaps in, and indeed, sometimes where we had tried to use these, we'd run into problems. Not quite sure why, but that's what Ring tell us is they're nothing special. These carry power, they carry data, which we believe is RS-485. Um, it could be CAN, 485 seems more likely, as uh, some of their marketing data does say 485. Um, and now we're into slightly uncharted territory um, what we believe happens is each device is sent a packet that contains the status of its outputs and then each device then responds with the status of its fuses, if it's fuses um, or what the current draw on everything are on the current draw on that channel is so that channel can be shut down i've not actually successfully managed to trip any channels um that might be because our power supply is uh, not really man enough to do it but i have seen it actually fitted to vehicles where it has tripped so that's fine we do know that works um, each device also has a unique id they are set on the ends let me get the one that's naked do you have an id he goes Focus. Anytime soon. Focus. There you go. Uh, let go straight away. So yeah, you've got a little white switch there which sets an ID for the device. Um, and then each device has a different ID. We've got some of these. Uh, I can't show you because they're bolted down. But some of these do actually have a Anderson power pole connector. Yeah, in that position there which appears to be a way of supplying power to the device without using these. 
Um, that would make sense if you're going to start remote mounting these. We have seen them remote mounted. Um, we had a vehicle with blue light problems. We spent ages trying to track it down. And then we found one of these buried um, in the top locker. And 16 channels driving four channels of light. It made sense to someone. So in these, they are fairly simple. So again, we've got, I believe that is a 18 series. That's a PIC 18F860. Um, that is handling all the comms. I've never found the transceiver on here. There must be one on here. And then we've got a lot of sort of small jelly bean logic and that going on. And then we have these wonderful automotive mo um, high side switches. Um, I should imagine they're MOSFET, um, but they provide current monitoring outputs. They provide fault outputs, temperature monitoring. They are literally everything you need to high side switch um, automotive um, things. So uh, quite useful devices. And unfortunately, also end of life. Um, we can't. We can get them, but uh, the manufacturer, who I think, if I remember correctly, these are Diode Incorporated, I believe. Yep. Um, they ha will not guarantee a supply of these. It's a very simple board. It's a lovely board. The construction's great. It's a four-layer board. Um, I suspect there is a ground plane and a power plane in there. We have a relay here, which all of these boards have, which appear to be to isolate the bus when it's um, connected or disconnected, or there may be a loop in, loop out thing type thing going on here. But there you go. There's nothing really special in here. Incidentally, we have got the microchip ICD headers there as well. And then if we look here, sorry, I've knocked you again. We've also got the ICD header present on these as well. Um, it leads me to suspect that the, pr the proprietary software they're referring to is probably MP Lab. Um, this is the ECU board. We've had a quick look at it. There really isn't anything special going on here. There's a lot of regulation. Um, these regulators do get very, very hot. There we go. But I suspect that's because they are literally supplying everything. The ECU also has provision to set an, uh, set an address. I'm not sure why that is. And then on the ECU, you've got various analog and digital inputs. You've got the bus, and then you've got a programming input as well. Um, the displays are pretty much of a muchness. There's nothing special about them. Um, generally, what the way you'd work with this is you've got the same pick buried down. You know, this is really picky about focusing. This is me trying open camera as well rather than using the Huawei software. So there is, as you can see down there, there's another pick micro down there. We've got your RJ45 inputs and outputs. That is going to be an off-the-shelf LCD module. And then another custom board for that generally with this kind of thing if i pull this out i don't know if you can see the back of that one i'm pretty sure it has got a cover on yes it does so generally if you're doing modular type things like this you will build one module for multiple versions so obviously we've got a position here for another connector that may be for a different type of display we've also got this connector this flat flex connector here um, that would be for possibly a smaller keypad. It may be what that one there is. Um, but there's no point in designing multiple versions of one board. If, oh, sorry. Designing multiple boards when multiple versions of the same board will do the job. It's a waste of time. We do it ourselves. Let me just plug that back in. So if I just bring this up and hopefully it will focus on it, you can just see it going through it. I'm sorry about the flickering. I know what that is. I can't do anything about it right now. So in normal use, this is just going to display um, the state of the battery so the crew know where they stand. And this will display any errors as well. Um, what signals we got active to the ECU? This thinks the engine is running, so we should be able to go... 999 mode activated. And there we go. The flickering on the pad itself is the multiplexing that's going on. There's obviously some weird beat type thing going on here. 
Leave scene mode activated. Arrive scene mode activated. Hospital arrival mode activated. And then obviously various things. So it should tell me. Oh, we have got a light over there as well. So this is possibly the world's most overcomplicated light switch. But that's essentially all there is to it. Um, sorry I keep knocking you. Um, it's designed to be modular. It's designed to be spread around the vehicle even though it generally isn't. Um, there are some known issues that we see with these. Um, on some vehicles, um, I think it's some of the Nissan Navara conversions that use one of these modules, uh, one of these ECUs, one of those output modules. Um, we have seen a failure in the output module and the ECU takes in the signal to turn the headlights on and because we want to flash the headlights, we drive the headlights ourselves. Um, one of these does have the headlamp flash. There we go. So if we come back here and we turn on the headlamp flash, if we can do it. So there we go, we've got the headlamp flash turned on. And if I pick up this module over here, which I really can't, so it will just quickly. Instantly, if you're going to work on these, make sure that these bus bars are isolated. You do have these lovely PTFE insulating sleeves so you can get in and uh, undo your... Uh, Allen screw in here without blowing yourself to kingdom come. Um, the trouble is, is these isolators can and do fall off. So if I now, I know I can do this because I'm safe, but if I now do that, <laughs> I find one that's not earthed properly. Um, or it's actually off. Yeah, it's actually off. Uh, the labels quite frequently fall off of these as well. But there you go, if you look on this one, can you see it on the bottom row here? You've got your drive out to the headlamp flash. So what is done on the Navaras is there is a headlamp input taken into the ECU. And then depending on the program, that will either flash the headlamps or turn the headlamps on. Um, it gets around one of the common problems um, whereby if you want to flash the headlights, you need to flash one at a time, which means you need to put a diode bridge in so you're not flashing both headlights at the same time. That causes you current drop, uh, sorry, voltage drop because of the current being drawn over the diode bridge. So if you do it this way, you're always driving them direct. However, if this system dies, you can't put the headlights on. Uh, a few people have been caught out with that one. This is a Genesis system. They all have their foibles. Um, we tried to design them out, but we're aware of scenarios in our system whereby if you over-rely on it, you're going to get into trouble. I mean, personally for us, we wouldn't do this. We would still wire the headlights the way that everyone always does them, either with a relay through one of the dedicated wheel and headlamp flashes, which use relays, um, or with a diode bridge. Um, Ideally, none of this should be able to cause problems for the vehicle chassis, and it certainly shouldn't be able to cause pro problems for emergency warning devices. Um, everybody has a different view on it. I mean, a lot of people say, well, if this isn't working, half of your other stuff isn't working. You know, you've not got your DFib charging, you've not got your CCTV, um, you've got no EWS, your split charge isn't going to work. So we probably shouldn't even be driving the vehicle at this point. That's fine unless you're somewhere out, out and about. And we have rescued vehicles from the side of the A3 in pitch blackness. Um, you know, in a sterile situation, no, you wouldn't take that vehicle out because you knew it was faulty. But if it goes faulty while you're out, you're screwed. But anyway, there you go. That's basically the way that all the lights, all your charging and all your control is done on a typical modern ambulance. Um, we do have the power distribution block that sits underneath the chair, underneath the driver's chair. Um, that is quite an epic piece of very high current um, cabling, which I will pull apart. Um, I can't believe it's taken me nearly two weeks to actually get around to getting a finished video out of this. This new setup should make for slightly better videos. Um, I will probably do something to stop the wobble on the floor. 
17th century building. It doesn't matter how try, hard I'm dry, I'm gonna, not really going to get rid of that. Um, but we'll take the power side apart next, and um, then uh, we'll find something else to do. I've got various other things lined up. Um, hopefully now that I have a uh, sort of video workstation area set up that I can tweak, um, we can get these done a little bit faster. I will probably go back to using the overhead shooting um, just because it's harder for me to knock the camera. And um, we are going to get that D-Slam one done as well. Um, event season would now have come to an end anyway. Um, so we're going to start putting some of the event kit away. Uh, it's a little bit unsure about what events are actually going to run next year. So we're actually going to put a lot of stuff in storage just to free up some space. So I can then get that D-Slam out and do that video for you. So anyway, quick one. Probably not particularly interesting. But uh, I've been promising I'll do this for ages. Take care.